We're very excited to have you here today to talk about this incredibly important topic of taxing the rich. As all of you no doubt know, we live in a time of extraordinary wealth concentration. According to the most recent data from the Federal Reserve, the wealthiest 1% of Americans currently own about $44 trillion, which is more than the wealth owned by 90% of Americans. This amount owned by the 1% is over a third of the country's wealth, which is a significant increase from even 10 years ago when the wealthiest 1% owned less than a quarter of the country's wealth. Moreover, all signs point to greater continued concentrations, particularly among the wealthiest of the wealthy. Recent data shows that America's billionaires saw their wealth grow an unprecedented 62% over the course of the pandemic. Well, the wealth of the wealthy is clearly growing. One thing that is far less certain is whether any of this wealth will ever be subject to taxation so that it can be used to cover the expenses of government, things like national defense, roads and bridges, and taking care of our most vulnerable citizens. On the one hand, it would seem that the answer would be an obvious yes. After all, the federal government imposes multiple taxes, often at progressive rates, such that those with the most pay the highest amount. And so that we can all be on the same page, um, if you could share the slide, we can see um, what those uh, taxes look like. Great. Uh, so when we're talking about taxes, there's three types of taxes. The first is income taxes. Those are the taxes people are probably most familiar with. It's the taxes that is, are imposed on people's wages and on uh, other ways that they might acquire wealth, but uh, notably not on things like uh, inheritances or, or um, gifts, some of the ways that the wealthy receive their, wealthy, their wealth. Uh, the second tax is capital gains taxes. Those are imposed at a rate of up to 20%. Um, and the, the capital gains tax is the tax that's imposed when people sell property. Uh, finally, we have uh, estate and gift taxes. Those are the taxes that we hear a lot about um, in political debates. Sometimes they are referred to as the death tax, um, but it is the tax that's imposed on transfers of wealth, typically between generations. And that tax is at 40%. Taken together, you'd think that we would have quite a robust system for imposing taxes on, uh, on the wealthiest Americans. Uh, we can take the slide down now. Um, on the other hand, um, some have expressed concern that the rules are not as they initially appear and that there are many ways that the wealthy are able to avoid them, um, particularly when it comes to the type of wealth that, is, uh, that the wealthiest Americans tend to have. First of all, um, many wealthy Americans are able to avoid income taxes by avoiding the type of income that is subject to tax um, or by uh, offsetting that income with uh, different uh, deductions that are available, uh, particularly for the wealthy. Uh, others say that the capital gains taxes are easily avoided, uh, and we'll be talking about that in greater detail in this program. And finally, uh, the estate and gift tax system, uh, many say is, is really uh, ridden with loopholes such that many people can avoid those taxes as well. Um, well, there've been a lot of different views around whether the rich do or do not pay taxes. Uh, beginning last year, the public for the first time had access to something it rarely had access to, which is information um, from actual tax returns from some of the wealthiest Americans. And that data has shown some alarming results. Namely, many of America's wealthiest Americans paying little or no taxes. How is this possible? And what, if anything, can we do about it? To help us understand this issue, we're very excited to have some of the country's leading experts. Uh, first, we have Jesse Isinger. Jesse Isinger is a senior editor and reporter at ProPublica. He led the secret IRS files project using a trove of IRS data to explore how the ultra wealthy avoid income taxes. He's the author of The Chicken Shit Club, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives and won a 2011 Pulitzer Prize. Uh, 
Uh, we also have Tabitha Peavy joining us. Uh, Tabitha Peavy is an attorney advisor and transfer tax specialist for the Tax Law Center at NYU Law. The Tax Law Center seeks to protect and strengthen the tax system through rigorous, high impact legal work in the public interest. Before joining the Tax Law Center, Tabitha worked as an attorney for several years providing trust and estate planning services to ultra high net worth individuals and families. Michael Strain is an economist and senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's the author of The American Dream is Not Dead, But Populism Could Kill It, a 2020 book. And he's a frequent contributor to the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Bloomberg, and other publications, and a frequent guest on radio and television. Uh, me, I'm Ray Madoff, a professor at Boston College Law School who specializes in tax issues and the wealthy. Um, let's begin with Jesse. Uh, could you tell us, Jesse, the, uh, the news from ProPublica and the uh, reports that you've had about taxing the wealthy have really been extraordinary. And I'm wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about how you got that information and what you found. Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Ray, um, and thanks to my fellow panelists, and I appreciate NYU uh, paying attention to this crucial issue uh, and um, and uh, the chance to discuss our work. So ProPublica is a nonprofit investigative news organization. We're supported by donations from foundations, individuals, and uh, some benevolent oligarchs. Uh, and uh, we obtained a trove of tax information on the wealthiest American taxpayers. Uh, and we're not explaining much about uh, how we obtained that or when, but a uh, source of sources gave it to us um, and we've been culling it for information. It covers tax information about the wealthiest American taxpayers. As I said, we, we have thousands of Americans uh, tax information. And we have information going back more than 15 years uh, or so. It's uh, not information on uh, plumbers and waitresses. Uh, it's not information even on the affluent, like doctors or lawyers or even, you know, partners at uh, high-powered law firms that do tax law. Uh, they get paid a lot. That they're not in our data. We have really the 1% of the 1%. Um, and we have been culling it uh, for stories that we regard to be in the public interest. We consider this to be an awesome responsibility. Um, it was a complex process. Uh, we had to look at the data and try to figure out whether it was valid. Um, we spent months verifying the data culling um, the information, putting it into uh, a, a kind of database that we could use um, to sift through for stories. And we've been doing stories about it all year. Uh, we assembled the largest team in ProPublica's history. ProPublica is about 13 years old. So um, that's uh, uh, not saying a ton, but it is, it's pretty significant. Um, and uh, we gathered a, a series of, uh, or a group of uh, reporters and data experts and people um, in visual journalism to do a series of stories. And we've been doing a series of stories since uh, around June. And the first story I did with uh, Paul Keel, who helped lead this project, and Jeff Ernsthausen, um, and that was a story looking at the top 25 wealthiest Americans and we, uh, the most important thing to us uh, when we started looking at this information, we clearly found that it was accurate, valid information. Um, that was the, the most important thing. And then once we did that, we were trying to see what was going to be newsworthy and in the public interest. And we initially thought that we would look at what the effective tax rate of the wealthiest Americans um, is. Uh, the IRS puts out the effective tax rate and they uh, break it down um, in certain levels, but they don't really go to the tippy top. Um, and so you can't see what the people who make the highest incomes uh, are paying in taxes. But we quickly realized uh, 
uh, that income really isn't where the story is and that the wealthiest Americans have control over their income. They effectively decide when and if to take income at the time and place of their choosing. And so we quickly realized that the effective tax rate for the wealthiest Americans is quite low. Um, in fact, uh, in, let me just define those terms. So what Americans pay income tax on income and income can come as uh, Ray, you pointed out uh, from wages, from salary, it can also come from capital gains, from selling things, um, and there are a variety of other things, but those are the two sort of main buckets, dividends as well, and those are taxed at different rates, um, but that's income. But it turns out that the wealthiest keep their income relatively artificially low. So while we did present the effective tax rate, how much federal income tax, the wealthiest pay on their income, we concentrated on our first story on what we thought was the most important point, which is that because you keep your income low, you can keep your taxes low. And so our story was about, sorry, uh, just to finish the sentence, the tax rate that they pay on their wealth growth, and it was extremely low, 3.4%. And can you can you tell people how do people keep their income tax low? Because that I think is is one of the surprising things that you found. You'd think that if you're with the 25 richest people, that they'd have a lot of income. So how do rich people keep their income low? Yes, well, they don't need income. And the primary way to do that is to accumulate wealth growth in their store of assets. Uh, often that's a company, like a publicly traded company. Um, and so you'll see that with someone like Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Warren Buffett, uh, and they accumulate that wealth in that stock. The stock goes up. The stock might not pay dividends, so they don't pay taxes on the dividends, and they don't sell. Um, or and they don't they get can, salaries? And they keep their salary is very low. Now, some CEOs have uh, been celebrated for getting $1 salaries. Um, salaries are, uh, high salaries are taxed at the highest marginal tax rate, 37% right now. Um, and so they're uh, keeping in, Jeff Bezos gets us a middle-class salary of around uh, 70 or $80,000 typically. Uh, they keep their salaries very low and they um, keep their concentration of their wealth in their stock or in their assets, uh, and then they don't sell. And if you don't sell, you don't pay taxes on it. So how do you live? Uh, well, often they borrow against that store of assets. And the technique that the ultra wealthy have is known as buy, borrow, die. You buy or build your asset, you borrow against the, um, uh, the asset that is tax-free. And then when you die, and we're going to get into this later, you uh, have ways of avoiding gift and estate tax. Uh, and so you uh, avoid taxes that way. And how do you, uh, how do you pay back? If you, you, I understand you buy and you let it grow, but don't you have to pay back your lenders? Yeah, that's a kind of misconception um, about the buy, borrow, die strategy is, um, isn't this going to come due eventually? Uh, yes and no. Uh, first of all, they're borrowing at um, almost zero. Uh, and it's not just because they are uh, paying a very low rate, although they get charged uh, a low rate often. But even more frequently what happens is a bank just has collateral um, in their stock. And you've seen this with Elon Musk because he's actually uh, pledged tens of billions of dollars of stock and borrowed against um, his stock. And uh, so they have the stock at the bank. Um, so they're not really worried about you paying it back because if the stock falls, they get to, they have the stock and they can just make a collateral call. Uh, and it doesn't actually cost them that much money because they can do things with the stock, like lend it out um, and uh, charge people for uh, borrowing it. And so it's very, very inexpensive borrowing, um, almost uh, interest-free borrowing uh, for the wealthy. And they get to fund their lifestyles this way. You can see uh, 
uh, you see Glitter's filings. Uh, uh, Larry Ellison has borrowed uh, against his store of wealth. Not all of them do this. Uh, I think Warren Buffett is the king of tax avoidance, as we've discussed um, in our stories. Um, he pays is paid the least uh, tax against his wealth growth in our data um, far and away, but there's no evidence that he borrows and he lives a pretty frugal lifestyle, it appears, uh, um, mostly drinking Cokes and eating hamburgers. But uh, a lot of these guys do borrow against their store of wealth. Isn't that ironic since Buffett is sort of one of the best known people about, about the importance of the wealthy paying taxes. He's a big advocate for the wealthy paying taxes. It's interesting that he himself uh, hasn't been paying. Well, he, he emphasizes tax rates um, and he emphasizes the lower tax rate for uh, capital um, capital gains rate, which uh, reaches uh, uh, almost 24% if you tack in um, a little extra for Obamacare. And, um, but that's sort of beside the point for the ultra wealthy and it's beside the point for Buffett himself. Um, so there is, a, uh, I think, a high degree of hypocrisy there because when he says, as he famously has, that rates should go up, and that he pays a lower tax rate than his secretary, he's forgetting to mention that he keeps his, uh, he is, his income is something in the range of you know, top 4,000th uh, of Americans while he's one of the top 10 wealthiest Americans. Um, and uh, you know, if you have no income, then you don't even pay any rate of income tax, much less a lower rate. So our, our conversation, the national conversation has been perverted to discuss and focus on marginal tax rates around income tax in particular. Uh, and I think that that largely misses the point. And the other point to make here is that this technique is entirely legal. Um, this is, wealthy tax avoidance that is uh, a product of the system that we have, that we understand that we have, the wealthy understand it, um, and it's quite easy to execute. Uh, and if you avoid income, you avoid income tax uh, in a perfectly legal way. Uh, and so to address that, we would have to address the system of taxation um, that we have. Great. And we're going to talk about some of those methods later on. And, and we're going to be circling back to you, too, when we're talking about um, some of these uh, other issues in taxes. But I want to just so just to get everybody on the same point, I, what you're saying is something very important, which is that the wealthiest Americans, um, while we have these progressive income tax rates, they don't really pay them frequently because they are able to avoid income. Well, most Americans take their income through salaries and, um, and uh, uh, things like that, which is subject to very high taxes. Wealthiest Americans are able to avoid taxable income because they don't take high salaries. If they control their companies, they don't issue dividends and they rely on their business investments, which grow and grow over time. And as you say, they don't borrow, uh, they don't sell them. So they don't sell them, so they don't have capital gain. Um, but uh, Tabitha, um, surely they must have to sell them at some point because even if uh, they don't sell them, someone's gonna wanna get the money and maybe their heirs will sell them. So why won't we get our capital gains taxes then? Yeah, so this is really great because I think what Jesse has and, and you've so eloquently summarized is how our tax code treats income from labor, from working and getting wages versus income, economic income from the growth in your wealth. And it's supposed to be subject to tax on a sale, right? Those are the capital gains rates. But there's this provision in the code that says if I die holding that asset, I will not have to pay any income tax on that gain. So if I buy a house for $100 and it keeps rising in value, I'm able to borrow against that value, use that value as collateral to fund my lifestyle. But when I die, that income tax liability on that growth is completely wiped out. 
And my heirs don't pay income tax on that accumulated wealth that happened during my life. Is so that step up in basis thing that you sometimes hear Biden complaining about? That is step up basis. And so people, you know, feel some type of way about it because it wipes out all of the income taxes that are accumulated over this individual's lifetime. Is there Those, any justification for that? Why does why do we do that? Why do we have uh, that step up in basis? So, in part, there, in my, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why we do this, but as a oh, excellent, Michael knows, <laughs> Michael, great. Uh, basis step up is conceptually reasonable, even if uh, it's uh, uh, prudent to eliminate it. The idea is that an individual is responsible for paying taxes on the appreciation of an asset while the individual owns that asset. Uh, And so if I go and buy a house today, or if I go and buy a bunch of shares of a a, a company stock today, and I sell those uh, assets 20 years from now, I should only be responsible for the gains that accrued while I held the asset. Um, if somebody gives me a house or gives me some stock, uh, which is what happens when people inherit um, inherit assets, uh, why should I be responsible for the uh, the capital gains that occurred before I was I was the owner of, of those assets? That's true, Michael. Um, but I, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. We uh, we we you know. Tabitha might object, uh, oh, but then those assets escape taxation, uh, which, which, is, which, is, uh, which, is, which is, I think, much more true in reality than it should be, um, but which uh, the estate tax is supposed to capture. Right? So we right. level so- estate taxes on somebody's estate when they pass away, and those estate taxes are supposed to to tax the, 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 the gains on assets that that person held during that person's lifetime. The problem is the estate tax is a mess and doesn't actually, doesn't actually you know, there are lots of ways to, to, to get around it. Um, so step up in basis, conceptually reasonable, uh, but dependent on an estate tax that actually works. And if the estate tax doesn't but, work, then what do we do? Yeah, I, I agree oh, with ahead, your Captain point. Time that I shouldn't have to pay tax on income that acu- that somebody else accumulated. But what's happening with step up and basis is that the individual who's accumulated income isn't paying tax on any of that accumulated income and didn't pay tax on it their entire life. And you're right that the estate tax is supposed to be kind of an imperfect backstop to that. And the estate tax does not work to do that. But also, there's no income tax on inheritances. So when my heirs receive that inheritance, the estate tax is the only type of tax on that windfall, right? And that's, sorry, Ray, go ahead. No, no. And and can I just add one more piece, which is Mm -hmm. that in your original example, Michael, you said if somebody has property and it goes up in value, right? So let's say I was, I bought Bitcoin uh, a few years ago when it was 400 and now it's, 4,000 or 40,000, it might be 40,000, is it now? Uh, whatever, event, something high. And um, if I give that to somebody, don't they have my basis? Even though I accrued that gain, don't they get my basis in that property if I give it to them during life? Mm-hmm. So the idea that I, if I'm, I'm, I can't get out of the gain by simply giving it to somebody else while I'm alive. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. But That's when right. I'm dead, then I'm able to. It, it seems yeah. like a funny disconnect. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I would just add, uh, yeah. I'll just add a historical um, uh, touch point to this, where, uh, which is that we were kind of looking into where, where this came from, step up and basis. Uh, and it started in the 1920s. Um, and it was really uh, meant only for when a husband transferred assets to a wife uh, back then. Um, it was 
typically husbands uh, owning the property um, and giving it to a wife. And it was not envisioned at all as a kind of get out of jail free card for all um, gains to any time that it's uh, transferred at death and it's expanded and expanded. So um, I was, I'm was i surprised that uh, Michael's are defending the, um, the underlying logic of it because uh, my understanding is that it's sort of, uh, that's kind of post hoc logic attached to a complete accident of history that's become a giant loophole. Right. So I think a time briefly, look, to, <laughs> there wasn't there a time briefly where they got rid of step up and basis in the 1970s, but it was quite short lived. Um, and I don't, so maybe we'll see that happen again. Uh, but anyway, we must move on because there are other taxes. So let's say spine, this capital, it's not subject to tax, but we have an estate tax. Oh, I'm sorry, Ray, I, I missed. I, I, I think you may be cut cutting out. out. I think right now Ray is defending the step up in basis. He's <laughs> 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 so, agreeing that so I think, it makes yeah, a lot so, of sense as part of a coherent <laughs> overall income tax system. <laughs> so we've got this income tax system that allows large amounts of accumulated gain to go untaxed, right? And you can defer that tax over your lifetime and or you know decide when to pay it that deferral is very valuable the average employee doesn't get to decide hey irs i'll pay you later i'm going to just take my tax money and invest it instead right but wealthy americans who a predominantly source of their wealth and their income is from capital assets get the benefit of lower rates this deferral and if they defer long enough until they pass away though that income that that gain is completely wiped out and they will never pay tax on it the estate tax steps in it's a 40% tax rate, as you mentioned earlier, as an imperfect backstop. It's part of the solution to this incomplete tax, income tax system. But the estate tax, and Michael alluded to this, is not very effective at its job. Um, it's been whittled away over the last couple decades. Most recently, the 2017 tax um, law doubled the amount that an individual can give on during life or on death without sub before they're subject to that tax. So today adjusted for inflation, I can give on death or during my life a little over $12 million, completely free of estate and gift tax. So if I'm worth $12 million, I don't have to worry about it. If I'm worth $13 million, that first 12 goes tax free, that last 1 million might be subject to the estate tax. But there are so many holes in our tax system. It's really easy to make it look like you don't own an asset so that it's not subject to the estate tax when you pass away. Um, so neither system is working very well on targeting this wealth. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Like you were a, a, uh, an estate planner for high net worth individuals, right? And so let's say I come to see you and I have... Um, uh, I'm married and I, I, have, I don't have a mere $24 million, which you can easily protect. I have like a hundred million, but I don't want to pay any taxes. I feel that this is a double tax that hurts family farms and businesses. And why should you kick me when I'm down? I'm very much opposed to it. What can you offer me and other clients such that I'm not going to be subject to that big that big 40% tax. Yeah, so there are a variety of tools that the estate planner has in their toolbox that are a result of inadvertent anti-abuse rules being turned on their head or you know, conscious policy choices. When a client comes into your office and they say, I don't wanna pay estate tax for a variety of reasons, what you have to do is remember that the estate tax is owed on anything I own at death. So if I own it at death, I will pay estate tax on it if I'm worth more than the $12 million. So an easy way to do estate tax planning is to just not own anything, right? Give it all away. But people want their things while they're alive. They need access to it. They need to fund their lifestyles. And don't what, you pay taxes if you give it away under the gift tax? You will pay gift taxes if it's over $12 million. So that's the other thing, right? You don't want to trigger an inadvertent gift tax. So there are ways to make it look like you don't own the asset, to give the asset away 
put it in this little bucket over here so that when the IRS looks at it, they say, oh, you don't own that, that's in the bucket. But the complexity in the code through grantor trust, grantor retained annuity trust, self-canceling installment notes, there's so many tools, allows me to take a bulk of my wealth, put it in this bucket so the IRS doesn't think I own it, and siphon the economic benefits off while I'm alive. And I continue to do that so that I can fund my lifestyle. Um, so it's in that way that both our income tax system and the estate tax system that's meant to fix this are failing to tax gains from wealth. And, and would you say that these income tax planning techniques, are these things that Congress wanted to encourage? Did they want to encourage people doing skins and grats and cuperts and all of your alphabet soup of planning tools? Is that something, do you know what I'm saying? Is it like the charitable giving where Congress intentionally wanted to incentivize these activities or was it something, is it something else? There, there's a long history of how the estate tax has come to be, right? The decision to double the exemption is clear what motivated that. Um, some of these rules are, some of these tax planning techniques result from inadvertent results of some anti-abuse rules. I don't know that Congress intends to incentivize complexity and inefficiencies that result from navigating holes in our tax code, but I do know that they have the power to fix these holes, to plug them up, and it is a policy choice not to in some ways. So you could get rid of the grantor retained annuity trust, you know, um, there's no reason not to. And so, all right, so let me just make sure that I'm understanding everything. What I'm hearing so far is that there are ways that uh, wealthy people are able to avoid income because unlike people who have jobs, um, where they just get, where they live on their salaries, they, the type of income that they have is generally not subject to the income tax. So they have wages, uh, I'm sorry, they keep their salaries down and they primarily rely on their investment assets. The investment assets grow in value and they never sell the assets. They die, they get a step up in basis, their heirs get a step up in basis and they never pay income taxes or capital gains taxes either. Although we have an estate tax that's intended to sweep things up and ensure <laughs> that the wealthy are subject to tax, it sounds like that tax isn't, um, isn't very effective either because people are largely able to avoid it. And so, um, so now we have a system where there are lots of, and then when the heirs inherit the property, they are able to avoid paying taxes on it. And I think, Jesse, just to bring you back here for a minute before we get to Michael, I think that um, you, your work did some, uh, your, your articles, I think, included some work about that as well, right? About how the purpose of the estate tax, from my understanding, was to try to avoid this problem of concentrations of wealth, the very problem that we have today. Um, and I think that um, as part of your data, you had some information about that. Is that right? Yeah, we uh, wrote another story. Uh, my colleagues wrote another story about um, the heirs to a variety of fortunes that are over 100 years old. Uh, we looked in particular at the Mellon fortune. Um, Andrew Mellon was a famous uh, longtime Treasury Secretary in the 1920s, um, an heir to a fortune, uh, large banking and trust fortune, um, and the Scripps uh, fortune. Uh, and we looked at the Mars family. And, uh, and then we found in our data uh, today, the great grandsons and daughters of those fortunes uh, with uh, giant incomes that are um, taxed at very, very low rates um, because mostly what they're doing is living off dividends uh, or trust income. Um, and so you know, we, saw, we found a Mars great-grandchild who has uh, made half a billion dollars uh, in recent years in income and is paying extremely low rates. And uh, if you look at 
the Waltons, for instance. They're uh, some of the richest people in America. Uh, they're um, also people with the highest dividend income in America, and yet dividend income, thanks to the Bush tax cut in the early 2000s, uh, is now taxed at preferential capital gains rates, uh, and so is quite low, they have quite low taxes. So what we see is that it used to be in this, uh, in the United States, that we were a country that uh, both had what we thought was a lot of income mobility um, and relative kind of class mobility. Uh, that's kind of the uh, view, the cliche about the American economy, and that we didn't believe in the persistence of wealth uh, through the ages and generations. And today, now we have a calcified uh, class system where it's much more difficult to move around um, in uh, the income quadrants and uh, wealth quadrants. Uh, we have less mobility than Europe, um, and we have the persistence of great fortunes. I'd also um, just tack on to Jesse's point because you're mentioning these heirs, right, who inherit these great fortunes. And one question is, well, won't they be subject to a state tax, right? And because to whittle this down, this generational dynastic wealth, but there are still structures in our estate tax system that allows me, like if I was lucky enough to be one of these individuals, to put my assets in something called a dynasty trust. And that will pass assets on to generation to generation, and it will never be subject to estate tax, gift tax, or even the cousin generation skipping transfer tax. And states have eroded their rules against perpetuities that would otherwise put limits on how long assets can stay in a trust. And so that's one of the reasons um, this wealth in dynastic trust is able to grow far more exponentially than if you just transferred it outright. Wow. So it sounds like we are in a uh, troubling situation under current law if we care about taxing the wealthy. It sounds like there's a lot of ways that they're able to avoid taxes, but um, I guess, uh, um, um, and here, but just to be clear, as, as I understand it, what we're talking about here is not uh, is not even people who have very big salaries, right? Um, but really, people who have um, uh, large who have large wealth outside of salary income. That's uh, that's who we're talking about. When we're talking about the very wealthy. Um, so, Michael, I'd love to have you join in the conversation. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to know: Is your take similar, do you feel that we are, that we have a problem taxing the wealthy or we don't have a problem taxing the wealthy? And if so, um, what do you think are some of the um, ways that have been proposed to address it or other ways to address this problem if the current ways aren't working? Uh, yes, thank you. I don't think that there's any question, but that some of the wealthiest people in our country have, uh, figured out ways to uh, avoid uh, paying taxes on, on their wealth, you know, either during their lifetimes or, or, or when they pass away and, and, uh, and, 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 and pass on their wealth to their heirs. Um, I think that's just a, that's just a fact uh, of the world that we, that we live in. I think there's a question about how big of a deal this is. Um, you know, the fact that uh, the fact that Jesse is able to, to enumerate, you know, many if not most of the actual uh, people who are doing this, I think, you know, indicates itself that that this is a very small number of of, of, of families who are who are uh, uh, you know finding finding creative ways to pass on huge fortunes. Um, you know, most uh, I think most dynastic wealth dissipates. Uh, in, 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 a, in a you know two generations or, or three generations or something like that. There are of course families you know like the Waltons and, and like and like the, the the Mars family where, where that isn't the case. But uh, uh, you know I think I think this is not uh, this is not characteristic of upper income Americans certainly, uh, and it's not even characteristic of uh, Americans who become fabulously wealthy. Um, but uh, but yes, I think I think that I'm curious. Uh, 
I'm curious, Michael, about this, about that aspect of the wealth dissipating, because um, as somebody who teaches estate planning and, you know, keeps up the field somewhat, I find that uh, it seems like these um, generation skipping transfer, uh, the dynasty trusts seem to be quite a popular vehicle um, being, you know, uh, used by, um, you know, marketed very, very broadly to Americans. Is that, um, or is it the case that you don't think that that vehicle on its own does enough to, um, to avoid um, dissipations of wealth? I think, I think that, I think that, that, you know, we have to fix magnitudes. I mean, people certainly use that vehicle, but of course, you know, the vast majority of Americans don't acquire large amounts of assets and, and, and don't and, and don't use that vehicle and you know the, the, these conversations we tend you know tend to focus on you know the top you know one one hundredth of one percent of, of households by by income and you know 99.99 percent of, of people aren't in the top uh, one one hundredth of 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 one percent and so you know uh, the question of does this happen yes I think I think everything Jesse and Tabitha have said is 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 accurate. Uh, the uh, question of how big a problem is this relative to the amount of airtime it receives? Uh, you know, if I were to if I were to make a list of the you know twenty biggest problems in the United States, uh, this would not be on that list. Um, doesn't mean it shouldn't be addressed. Doesn't mean that it's not it's not potentially important, but. You know the fact that this has become an organizing principle of many uh, progressive politicians. The fact that this is something that gets mentioned in state states of the union addresses, things of that nature. Um, you know, I think I think uh, is is more attention than than it than it deserves analytically. Um, America is not a class based aristocratic society where the circumstances of your birth determine your outcomes in life. America is not, you know, the United Kingdom in the 18th century, where if you're, you know, rich today, it's because your great great grandfather was was rich. Um, that's just that's just not the situation that 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 we're in. Um, you know, which again is not to say that this is not a, 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 an important topic. I just I just think it's I, I think I think it, I think it gets uh, more attention than it than it deserves. A little unfair to focus on the number of families we're talking about because it also makes it seem like we're targeting those families when really, I mean, we're talking about the amount of revenue that we can raise or as, you know, rate 1% of all Americans own one third of the wealth in the country, right? So the magnitude of revenue that we're talking about from, you know, the efficacy of our tax system is actually quite large. So, um, yes, your, I don't think your targeting anybody but you know i do think that that some of the uh, elected officials who, mm. who have really made this uh into um a uh, uh um a big a big political issue and a major focus of our public debate are certainly targeting uh targeting individuals um you know otherwise there would be no there would be no reason to you know to 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 for these proposals to go after, you know, seventy-five thousand families, or to you know, you know, th th uh, things of that nature. I mean, they're they're very they're very explicitly designed to, to target individuals. I, I you know I I I think that um, there are two reasons to that this is actually quite an important issue, and and I would disagree that it it lacks importance. Um, and one is a kind of simple question of uh, revenue, um, as Tabitha was alluding to, which is that, uh, you know, you want to raise taxes. Well, um, you uh, same way Willie Sutton targeted banks. That's where the money is. Um, and a proposal from Ron Wyden, which we can kind of get into uh, in a bit, the billionaire's income tax would raise $600 billion over the course of 10 years. That's one of the major revenue raisers. That would be the single biggest revenue raiser in anything that the Democrats are currently contemplating. So in fact, there is a lot of money um, in billionaires to tax. Uh, there are few of them, but they got a lot of dough. And, um, and you could 
uh, you know, we are constantly co talking about a constrained fisc that, um, that uh, we're constantly kind of living, have a government that lives hand to mouth um, and is uh, kind of going begging for services. We have eroding infrastructure. We have um, uh, healthcare needs for the population and uh, social services of uh, a wide variety of, uh, you know, wide array of social services. and this could help pay for that. Uh, there's, but then there's a an issue of legitimacy and um, uh, and democracy uh, and fairness and equality and um, and a kind of living in an equitable society. And I think that when average people who pay through their W twos and pay uh, pay taxes, and when we talk about income tax, there is a large portion of the population doesn't actually pay income tax, but they pay what is called payroll tax, but that's a kind of branding um, uh, that tries to separate it. It's a federal income tax on your income. And when you add in payroll taxes, where you start the tax situation starts to look much less re progressive and even regressive in some cases. Um, and so the vast majority of working Americans are paying into the federal government. And then they see someone like Jeff Bezos, who we revealed uh, literally paid zero in two recent years, or Elon Musk literally paying zero, or uh, Michael Bloomberg paying zero in taxes. And I think that erodes people's confidence in the federal government, erodes people's confidence in um, the legitimacy of the government and their sense of fairness uh, uh, in in, in sense of that democracy is tilted. And so I think there are two issues at play that are pretty profound here. Michael, did you want to respond? You, you've had some. <laughs> uh, yes, I, 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 I just think that's overstated. I mean, uh, you know, we, we wealthy people pay a lot, you know, if, 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 we're, if we're concerned about dollar values, wealthy people, you know, pay, a lot of money in taxes to the federal government. We have a highly progressive tax system. Um, it may be that there are some years when, you know, some of the of the specific individuals at the very top of the of the income distribution uh, pay less than others. Uh, but but uh, on the whole, uh, the more money you earn, the more you pay in taxes. I don't think that we are anywhere close to a crisis of legitimacy uh, in the you know federal tax system or in our in our system of, of, of representative democracy uh, you you hear advocates on the progressive left talk about uh, illegitimate uh, democracy talk about how you know America is a nation of oligarchs that rhetoric has always been, I think, wildly overstated, probably appears more overstated today than, than it used to, but it's always been, it's always been overstated. Uh, you know, I, I, I do, of course, agree with Jesse that there's a lot of money there and that we, and that we have a lot of programs that we, that we need to pay for. And so, you know, increasing the amount of revenue that the federal government receives is, I think, uh, an appropriate goal for public policy. The question is just how do you do that? Um, and uh, uh, you know, I think I think that, uh, that that going after the wealth of seventy five thousand families doesn't seem uh, like the place I would start. So, can I offer just a, some a data counterpoint, um, if I may? Because you you said that the income tax is a progressive system and um, and I think that that's simply not factual. Um, and so if you look at the data from the IRS, the people who pay the effective, highest effective tax rate make two to $5 million a year. And that's a lot of money. We don't have to, uh, you know, it, you know, we don't have to feel enormous amount of sympathy for it, but in our system, those guys are the schmucks. They, they pay the most. And then, um, and so it's progressive, just talking federal income tax, excluding payroll tax, though it is progressive up to then, but then it actually starts to be regressive. And so if you're in the top 
0.1%, you took in about $69 million um, in 2018. You've paid uh, less than um, what the the highest earners have paid. So the 22 to 5 million have paid 27.5% effective tax rate. The top 001%, excuse me, I misfed it. The 001% making 69 million, they pay 23%. So it's actually regressive. And then in our uh, billionaires, the top 25 paid 13%. So it actually turns into a regressive system just on income tax. I'm mean, not talking about, uh, I don't think that's the right way to measure it because I think you should measure the wealthy's uh, taxes compared to their wealth growth. Um, but in our system, we, we tax income and the ultra wealthy take so little in income and pay so little that it's actually regressive at the top. The experience of 99.99% of households is that the more money you earn, the more income tax you pay. Uh, and if there are some years where households in the top 0.01% pay less than people who earn a few million less than them, we should characterize the system as highly progressive. Okay, so let's move on right now because we could have a lot of discussions on this issue. I'm not sure. I do think that, um, uh, but well, anyway, let's move on to this. Uh, we, which is um, because it sounds at least like what we have as a system is that we might have a progressive income tax system, largely progressive. It might be pro largely progressive, regressive at the top, but it also seems to be the case that there are large amounts of wealth, namely appreciation of capital assets uh, that we are not really effectively taxing. Um, and also that, uh, and things like inheritances and gifts and things, they also may not be. So I think we might have some agreement about some of those things. Um, and, uh, and in any event, what I'd love to hear, because uh, Michael, I know you've been working on these different things, is what, so what is being proposed? Uh, we can uh, then talk about which ones we like and don't like, but it would be really helpful if you could lay out for us, um, you know, Jesse mentioned one, he mentioned the widen, uh, the widen billionaires income tax. Um, if you could explain, uh, Michael, that and some other, what you think of as the most prominent proposals that are out there to tax the rich. That would be very useful. But on this subject, I think the most prominent proposal has probably just been a straight up wealth tax, you know, again, that would that would target uh, a, a very small number of, of, of families. Uh, and, uh, and you go, you calculate their wealth every year, you take 2% of that, um, and, uh, and, and, and they owe that in, in, in tax revenue. Um, be subject to that tax. I'm sorry? Who would be subject to that tax? Very, very wealthy people. Uh, you know, different proposals. You know, target different different amounts. But what do you mean by very wealthy? Uh, Five million, ten million? Oh, I think much. I think I, I think much higher than that. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Elizabeth Warren's plan was to tax uh, fortunes above fifty million uh -huh. at one percent, and then. Uh, and, then, and then fortunes above one billion, uh, I believe uh, she would have an additional uh, percentage point on that. So fifty million to to a billion, one percent, a billion plus, uh, two percent. Uh, you know this. So this is this is a very small. I think this is less than a hundred thousand households uh, that 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 would be that would be targeted there. Would it raise any money? Sure. Yeah. There's a lot of, I mean, Jesse's absolutely right. That there's a lot of, there's a lot of money um, uh, there. There's, you know, there's, there's considerable debate about how much money uh, it would raise. Um, but, uh, you know, it could, it, I mean, it would raise, I think, at least, you know, several hundred billion dollars a year. Uh, some estimates are, you know, as high as three trillion. I think those are, I think those are too high, but uh, wow. you know, you're, because you're, the total tax revenue, I understand in 2020 was just 3.5 trillion. So, I mean, something that raised in the trillions would really be quite extraordinary considering how, you know, considering what the total revenue is. Yeah, I think it wouldn't raise in the trillions, but I think it would raise, I mean, but I think, you know, you know maybe some years it could raise a trillion. I think that's, I think that's totally plausible. Uh-huh. 
Okay, so uh, so there's one. One is the wealth tax. We know it was proposed by Senator Warren and Senator Sanders, um, and um, and that's something that has received a lot of attention. What are some of the other popular proposals that have been put forth? Um, so just the wealth tax is a different kind of tax system where where you're actually taxing assets. Um, another. Uh, uh, way to go about this, which I think Tabitha mentioned, is to tax accrued capital gains. Uh, if you, if you, you know, we have an income tax system, and if you, if you define income as equal to consumption plus changes in net worth, uh, then what you want to do is assess changes in net worth every year uh, and tax those those gains. And so, so just so I understand, if we have a simple example, we have Jeff Bezos, whose Amazon stock has probably gone up from worth about, I don't know, $10,000 to uh, $150 billion, something like that. Um, and so he would be taxed on those gains, even if he didn't sell the stock. Is it would be taxed. Ev- it would tax on the annual gains, uh, uh, even if he didn't sell the stock. Yes, exactly. So every time the stock accrued, he would it increased in value. He'd pay taxes, and then what happens when the stock goes every, down in value? Every year at tax time, uh, you know, I sit down and look at my income uh, and pay a tax on my income. Uh, and every year at tax time, Jeff Bezos would sit down and look at his income, but then he would also look at how much how much. Uh, Amazon stock increased his net worth, uh, and uh, and he would pay a tax on on that incremental increase in value. Okay, and um, all right, so that is a tax on accrued capital gain. So that would basically avoid it would um, it would mean that people are currently subject to their income taxes uh, to their capital gains taxes, even if they didn't sell their stock. Is that right? Okay. Can I just uh, can I just elaborate a little bit on that, uh, Ray? Um, yeah. So it, the Wyden proposal uh, covers people who would uh, who make a hundred million dollars in three years running or billionaires, and it actually plays out over ten years. Um, and so it kind of takes into account that sometimes uh, wealth. Uh, goes down, um, and then you uh, get a refund. So that it, um, that if your wealth went up in ten years, then you would pay, and if it goes down in uh, one of the years, that uh, it sort of nets out. Um, and so, in fact, you're not sort of ponying up every single year with money, and then getting a giant refund the next year from uh, from the government. And um, and it, it should be said that Michael's exactly right that a wealth tax, the way, uh, uh, excuse me, that is my dog, um, uh, who's probably arguing with me that a wealth tax is better than a uh, mark to market. Um, a wealth tax is a, is a new system um, and, uh, and would require um, a lot of rethinking and possibly, and would be challenged constitutionally. A mark to market system where you measure the value of assets each year, the way Wyden is proposing, that actually is uh, based on concepts that are deeply embedded in the existing tax code already today. Uh, hedge funds opt for mark to market treatment of their assets on unrealized gains uh, already um, frequently. Um, debt is taxable uh, in treated like income in certain cases already in the code. There's, um, there are lots of uh, aspects of the code that exist today that um, looks very much like what Wyden is proposing. So it's not particularly revolutionary um, and doesn't require a different system. It just expands our definition of income. I mean, I, I would even go further than that. It's, it's a, it's. I don't think it expands our definition of income. I think it, I think it just more accurately captures our definition of income. Um, I agree. You know, yes. income, <laughs> I think we all agree you on know, that. You think of, I mean, again, income you know, is equal to consumption plus changes in net worth. Uh, and the only reason, you know, the 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 arguments against doing this, if if you're committed to an income tax system, the arguments against doing this are practical arguments about administering. And uh, Jesse's uh, characterizing Senator Wyden's proposal accurately. Uh, 
but that those are all just administrative concerns. Uh, you know, the you know the the actual kind of underlying economics here are that if you you know if you're if you have fifty thousand dollars of of of, of uh, uh, if your net worth goes up by fifty thousand dollars because your house appreciates or because your stock portfolio appreciates or if you're Jeff Bezos and it goes up by fifty million dollars under an income tax system you should pay tax on that. Jesse's right. If your if your stock portfolio falls, then your net worth falls and your income falls. And so, you know, if your income is negative, you should under the system get a, get a credit. Um, and you know, it makes sense administratively to do this over a long time window so that you're not uh, you know writing checks to rich people every year when the stock market is, you know doesn't doesn't perform well. Um, but uh, but the kind of underlying uh, economics of it, you know, are 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 exactly that. We've I had, think uh, headline oh. of AEI endorses billionaires tax. Well, I'm not saying I uh, agree. Is, with uh, <laughs> is, uh, I, we, we've made some news here. No, no I'm not no. saying I agree with it. I'm just saying it's coherent. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Some uh, we have a, a, a audience member, one who's asked a question about: Do we have a problem with constitutionality of either a wealth tax or an accrued tax? Uh, what do you think, uh, Michael, on that? I mean, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a constitutional scholar. My understanding is that there are serious constitutional questions about a wealth tax. Um, I don't think that there should be any questions about taxing accrued capital gains. Uh, and uh, Tabitha or uh, uh, Jesse, either of you want to add to that? You know, I, I'm. I'm not a constitutional lawyer either. Um, but you know, when you're picking policies, I think these sort of legal challenges could be relevant. Um, but and, and what about inflation controversy? Is yeah. that do do either of these take into account if proper right? We haven't been dealing with inflation for a long time, but you know we might be dealing with it right now. And and so if property goes up simply because uh, you know for inflationary reasons, is that accounted for in any of these systems? Uh, no, but it you you make a very good point, which is that um, we already have a wealth tax in America um, at the state and local level, and it's property taxes. Um, and uh, we have a wealth tax for what constitutes the bulk of wealth for typical Americans. Um, and so this concept exists, um, uh, but you know isn't. Uh, in play for the ultra wealthy. Um, the constitutional so, question is about the federal. Th yeah, there's of no course. constitutional question. Yeah. Of course, uh, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't. I'm not a constitutional expert either. But um, and I wasn't. I I just meant to add to that there is a conceptual level um, at which uh, you know we have a wealth. We have something that looks like a wealth tax um, in America. But uh, there's no question a wealth tax would be. Uh, would be subject to constitutional challenge. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's un, uh, that, that is undeniable. And, um, and uh, what, that would be a political argument, I think, for uh, people to strongly consider other alternatives. And that's why the Wyden proposal seems to be getting some traction. But none of these proposals have any traction, uh, really, in Congress. In fact, uh, a democratically controlled Congress with huge fiscal ambitions uh, all last year and huge political need to show some accomplishment could not get taxing uh, the wealthy done in the United States last year, even though uh, it's extraordinarily popular, it pay it polls very well. So um, you see the hurdles to this. So we're talking about a wealth tax or a uh, you know a, um, uh, a mark to market billionaires income tax, and they can't even raise tax rates. Well, uh, but as you mentioned, raising tax rates doesn't look like it would accomplish much anyway. So, um, but let me ask you this now. So we've so we've talked about a wealth tax. We've talked about taxing accrued capital gains. Um, we talked earlier about switching the way, getting rid of step up in basis at death, either by having carryover basis or perhaps having it the gains taxed at death, right? That's another proposal that presumably Biden at least would like to see to get, because I know he'd like to get rid of step up in basis at death. Um, are there any other proposals that, people here on the panel think should be considered when we think about um, 
you know, a fairer tax system that um, subjects more of the wealth of the super wealthy to tax. Yes, um, I don't. I don't like any of the proposals that um, that that. Uh, well, that's not true. I I I I'd be I'd be fine with with basis stuff up, but I I would I, would, I oppose uh, wealth taxes and and you know as appealing as taxing accrued capital gains is, I think I think I would oppose that as well on uh, at least on uh, administrative grounds. Um, uh, you know, very hard to value uh, many kinds of assets like closely held businesses, for example. Uh, very hard for some small business owners to come up with with uh, the cash that they would need to you know to satisfy their tax bill. Maybe you want to restrict the uh, uh, the tax to to only apply to assets that are regularly priced like like stock holdings. But then you know what are you really doing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I I generally you know if I could I mean I agree with Jesse that it's, the, the the political prospects for any of this are, are extremely uh, low, but if I could wave a wand uh, and create a new a new uh, uh, revenue uh, system for the for the government, it wouldn't be to tax wealth and it wouldn't be to to, to increase taxes on income, it would be to tax consumption, um, and you know I would like to do that for for economic reasons. Uh, if we if we tax income, uh, or if we tax wealth, we are taxing savings. Um, we're taxing national savings, and uh, if we have less savings, we have less investment. And investment is what drives productivity gains uh, and wage growth for lower wage and middle middle wage workers over the long term. Uh, so I would like to see us, you know, look look somewhere else. For tax revenue than taxing wealth or taxing or taxing income. An obvious place to look is uh, to tax carbon emissions, um, and we could get a lot of tax revenue from taxing from taxing pollution, uh, and that um, that would have you know good good effects on the environment. Uh, 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 it would not target wealthy people, um, but it would it would generate a lot of tax revenue that could be used to. <laughs> What do you mean? By that? When you say tax emissions, that mean like I go drive my car to New York and now I pay a tax to somebody? Uh, yeah, in theory. Um, I mean, we could, you know, we could do it in a way that it didn't tax, uh, uh, it didn't increase the tax burden on, you know, households earning less than 40 grand or something like that. Um, but it would mostly apply to corporations. It would mostly apply to, to companies that, that, that whose productive activities are, 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 uh, uh, are, are uh, generating carbon emissions. Um, another clear way to do this is to tax consumption, uh, and you can tax consumption in a progressive manner. So households that spend a lot more money on stuff pay a much higher uh, consumption tax than, than, than lower income households. Uh, and this is a way to get at, at, at the wealthy. You know, don't, don't you know, try and add up the value of all their assets and then take a slice of it every year. Just when they buy a yacht or when they buy a you know, big townhouse in Manhattan or when they buy a Picasso or when they buy whatever, uh, subject, subject that to a federal consumption tax. Uh, and and uh, you know, that has the, the benefit of raising tax revenue without discouraging investment uh, and without discouraging savings. Um, and for people who are uh, very concerned about increasing the tax burden borne by the super wealthy, this is a this is a way to accomplish that goal as well. I, I think that um, what all of the proposals, besides the consumption tax proposal, attempt to do is fix this hole in our tax system on treating income from wealth. Most of the wealthy individuals in our country, as Jesse has alluded to, they don't have salaries. They rely on appreciation of their assets to fund their lifestyle. So these proposals that try to fix that, you know, either strengthening the estate tax or widens plan or a wealth tax are really trying to plug a hole in our existing system. Um, and I think any of them would work well if that's what we're trying to do. Um, 
the consumption tax kind of worries me because relative to the amount of money a wealthy individual is earning, they tend to spend less of it just as a proportionate share. Um, and so when I think about it, I still run into this problem where there's large amounts of income and large amounts of wealth that's being allowed to accumulate and not being subject to tax as effectively as someone who's living paycheck to paycheck, for instance. Um, and then I hear your point about investment and you know, entrepreneurship. I think when I did this in practice, we, we represented entrepreneurs and business owners. And anecdotally, I will say, when they got their businesses to be so successful that they're now in this upper echelon of people that's now subject to this estate tax that most Americans aren't, not one of them wanted to stop making money because of it. You know, they, they love the thrill of the deal and they loved running their business. And so it, it was, I, I never got to see that in practice, um, but, but I think any of these proposals in their attempt to fix this imbalance on how we treat or tax income from wealth versus income from labor would do a really good job at addressing this rising wealth gap that we're seeing. And Tabitha, is there anything else that you would want us to consider in terms of other proposals? Yeah, I think Lily Backdelder has a really nice proposal for an inheritance tax, which moves us to a true income tax system. So rather than an estate tax, and heirs would pay income tax on their inheritances. Um, and that would obviate some of the needs. We'd still have issues like valuation, Michael. Um, we'd still have and, but those are existing issues. They're not issues that are unique to any of these proposals. And so in our last, this has been very, very helpful. And, I've, and uh, I think this has been a, a great discussion of the array of possible choices. And I guess what I'd like us to do in our last three minutes is if everyone could look into their crystal ball and, um, and uh, answer um, uh, these, uh, the, the three questions. One is, um, or one question with two parts to it. One question is, to what extent do you think any of these are likely to happen? And if so, will it, it is because of, or if not, will, what are the positives and negatives that are kind of gonna be driving your, your answer, right? What, what do we think is likely to make it happen? What do you think is likely to not make it happen? Uh, and Over so- Over what time horizon? You choose the time horizon. One, one, five, or ten years. Pick one of those. Well, over one year, nothing will happen. Yeah. Uh, over five years, uh, probably nothing will happen. I do think that um, I do think that the odds of the United States uh, federal government instituting a tax on consumption or a tax on on carbon emissions uh, at some point in the in the longer time horizon are more likely than not. Um, I don't think it's going to be a wealth tax. The wealth tax is just so difficult to administer. I think that there were 14 countries, uh, uh, 14 OECD member, the OECD is kind of a group of higher income countries. There were 14 OECD countries that had a wealth tax uh, two decades ago. And I think all but four of those countries have dropped it at this point. It's just so difficult to administer a wealth tax. Um, but the so United States- was yeah, is, you're saying we'll have consumption like, or uh, or carbon tax within the next ten years. I think I I, I think it's more likely than not uh, one of the, one of the two. Right, and Tabitha, we just have uh, two minutes left. Yeah, so. so I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to be likely or not. I do think that coming out of Build Back Better, there's a lot of reason for optimism. We've put forth this issue of the wealth gap in the public discourse. People are talking about wealth taxes and accrual taxes in a way they weren't before. Um, that process was productive. It gave technicians an opportunity to weigh on the statutory language to make sure it works. Um, and so there's reason to be optimistic. Um, and we even had Bernie Sanders you know, propose for the 99.845% act that to fix and strengthen the current estate tax. So. That's the first part of policy making, in my opinion, is educating and raising awareness on these issues. And that's what we've been doing in our most recent history. So I think something will happen then. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jesse. Well, I hate to uh, end on a, uh, uh -oh. on a <laughs> disappointing note, but I'm profoundly pessimistic about any change. Um, uh, in, in 
past history, there have been great movements uh, on taxes. Uh, in the late 1960s, LBJ's Treasury Secretary released uh, the numbers of millionaires who paid zero in taxes, and it created such a groundswell of anger that they created the AMT, the Alternative Minimum Tax, which actually turns out to be um, a failed attempt to remedy this. Um, but there was a uh, movement. And, you know, we, we've we released uh, tax information on the wealthiest individuals showing that they literally pay zero in some years and pay very little tax. And there's been almost no political movement thanks to that. Um, and this is wildly popular, as I said, um, among the uh, public and there's the Democrats can't get anything passed. So I'm uh, extremely pessimistic that uh, the dysfunction of the Democrats um, will uh, just not result in any um, tax reform. Uh, we didn't even talk about the gutting of the IRS, uh, which was our series that we'd done a few years ago. Paul Keel and I did. Um, and so that's uh, we something have a, we would agree on more uh -huh. money for the IRS. I'm totally Excellent. With you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, you know. this is a perfect moment on which, unfortunately, we need to end. <laughs> consensus. Yeah. Consensus. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Uh, this has been a great discussion, and I really appreciate uh, everybody being here. So, thank thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye -bye.